Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, our first guest is Distinguished University Professor in Philosophy at Georgetown, Nancy Sherman. She previously served as Distinguished Chair in Ethics at the U.S. Naval Academy and was a fellow at the Wilson Center. Professor Sherman is the author of this book, The Untold War, Inside the Hearts, Minds, and Souls of Our Soldiers. Nancy, thanks for joining us. Welcome to Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Thank you so much, John. I want to ask you, uh, and this is a personal uh, observation that you can either correct me or not, but in, in uh, making our way into the subject matter, my observation is that we are great in this country at uh, uh, honoring the troops superficially, but we don't really want to talk about a lot of the things that you talk about in this book. I think that's right. I think uh, we're much better even honoring them superficially since Vietnam. Um, thank you for your service, there's not much spitting or... Standing ovations at sporting events, exactly. things like that. Exactly, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but the inner war that they're fighting isn't one people want to go to because they don't know how to begin the conversation. Soldiers, I use that term generically, don't always know how to begin the conversations for themselves. It's a long, slow process, and they're only a half percent or so that served this past decade of the population. Are the reasons uh, the obvious that war is an unpleasant topic and we just don't want to go there? Some of that's the case, and you know, and there are cultural trends. My dad, a uh, World War II veteran, was... Talk about that a, a bit, about your dad's experience and how that influenced your work. Well, my dad was of that laconic generation where you don't talk about war because it would pollute a family. Mm -hmm. you come home from World War II and you start over but you leave little traces behind. Army blankets, my dad was a medic. Um, uh, handsome Psy, the XGI is what he called himself. But you never really talk about it because it might leave a stain. And I think we're better, families are generally better in, in wanting to know more about wars and asking soldiers that come home. But still it's very hard because there's always, and this is part of my work, there's always moral doubt did I do the right thing? Did I, was it unfair that I survived and my buddy didn't? Is that how minimally or maximally culpable am I for that? Am I off the hook? I think there's lots of doubt. It is, uh, did, your, did you have this sense of your father's experience when you were a child that there were things he just didn't want to talk about or is this something that has become clear in retrospect? Probably retrospect, I had a very uncanny experience. My dad died about three years ago, and I was left to clean up the hospital room. And in his pocket, I found his dog tags. Um, so that's well over 50 years. He um, carried them with him. He carried them with him, but I didn't know. So that was maybe willful ignorance on my part, or just I didn't notice. And he never told me. So that's what I meant. He had a private kind of contract with himself that he wasn't going to forget and that he would carry the burdens of war. And, and uh, describe how your experience at the U.S. Naval Academy uh, fed into this project. Well, I was there for um, an ethics uh, cheating scandal, electrical engineering, and so um, I probably learned more from them than they learned from me. I, you know, I, I learned about the military in a way that I had left behind in a way, some ways with my dad, and I was also of the Vietnam era and hadn't really returned to think about a lot of my feelings. And so there I was next to lots of um, Navy captains and Marine colonels who had served in Vietnam. So this was the mid-90s and they had, now they're finishing up their career at the Naval Academy. And uh, I really got to understand a, a segment of society that I think most of my friends never really interact well with or at all with. Often people say that's because of the the nature of an all-volunteer army where no longer it's a what one percent war or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so it, part of it is not that we no longer have conscription and that's mm -hmm. definitely uh, a part of it a and another part of it is that it's a highly professionalized organization and it uh, you know it sticks to itself in some ways except when you're at war and you're representing the public. Um, but the public doesn't really understand much about the inner war those uh, Marines or Air Force or sailors, soldiers are facing. Expand on the idea of the inner war, this untold war that you talk about. So the untold war I'm thinking about is, of course, a psychological war. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not well captured by a phenomenon we now know and that's diagnosed, which is post-traumatic stress. I leave out the disorder because I think many 
um, find that D for disorder, PTSD, stigmatizing. We don't talk about a limb disorder. We talk about a limb injury. Yes. But there's a dimension of, of psychological uh, stress and inner war that doesn't rise to the rise to the surface easily and that's the moral war that i alluded to earlier how responsible am i for that accident that really looked like just bad luck was it brute bad luck you know the battery just um was the wrong battery though every engineer said it was the right one in one case a horrible case of a marine a marine battery is used to replace an army battery in a bradley fighting vehicle with the awful awful consequence that when the driver turns on the ignition the the gun at the turret went right off and it it killed a private who was standing in security detail nearby and so the guy that authorized the the um the battery felt horrific you know he said i'm not egregiously responsible but every day i feel guilt so what do we make of that guilt? Should we just dismiss it and say, get over it? Mm -hmm. Which is what, you know, lots would say it's irrational. Or should we give it credence and try to figure out as these soldiers and, you know, and service members are trying to do? What do we tell the soldiers through counseling or through military indoctrination? What are they told as far well, as how often, to deal with Well, often, that's a good question. Often, I mean, just now the veterans uh, affairs uh, and health uh, folks that are doing research are beginning to recognize that there's something called moral injury that's not about feeling helpless when you're faced with life threat. Post-traumatic stress is often fear, this kind of un horrific sense of helplessness in the face of life-threatening dangers. Mm -hmm. That's not what moral injury is. Moral injury is the nagging guilt or shame that I didn't, couldn't care for my troops. It's your conscience, it's your moral conscience. So how you treat it might have to be different. And so that's where the money should be right now, sort of figuring out therapeutic techniques. But it also, is, as a public issue, it's a place that we should be aware of, or, or a phenomena that we should be aware of. People obviously don't want to talk about it because they're afraid where they may go. I want to I want to ask you about a, a number of sources of these types of feelings and and battles within, and and get some comments from you whether you want to relate it to a story or, or however you yeah. choose to. What uh, one is what happens when uh, soldiers are involved in collateral damage? This. Uh, antiseptic term that describes the most horrific of events where things go wrong and someone is killed, innocents are killed. Right. Well, first of all, collateral incidents aren't well understood in terms of what's permissible or not. Philosophers could argue to the end of day about how much what, what's proportionate. Acceptable losses. Exactly. And sometimes the word accident is, is used. It, it's not the right term. Mm -hmm. It's you don't intend, but you foresee that you will kill these civilians. And again, who's a civilian who's a noncombatant is always up for grabs. That said, these incidents, partly because they're murky and partly because you don't, you know, how much counts as too much, uh, cause can cause her very, very great uh, moral danger, especially or moral injury, especially when the noncombatant really looks innocent. It's a child. It's a child who might look like the age of your children. It's um, you sh were sure someone had. Uh, uh, arms underneath that burqa, but it was an innocent woman, mm -hmm. et cetera. So the murkiness, the fog, as well as the resonance that, you know, these are these the, these folks don't have medevac. They may be in population centric warfares involved, but what counts is adequate involvement. Have I transferred enough of the risk to myself? How much risk should I transfer? It actually is morally unclear, and it's not surprising that soldiers internalize a lot of doubt and questions. Another really interesting thing you write about is uh, revenge. And this, all, this is a very human response, and this might explain some of the more aberrant behavior we've seen in places like Abu Ghraib or, or Haditha. Or Haditha, yes. Yeah. So revenge, you know, is as old as Homer, uh, an older, biblical, um, and it's payback. It's, a, it's, it's the bad retributivist sentiment where you want to get back, and anger um, get, can get very unruly, and it really requires enormous leadership command, good leadership climate and morale to be able to control your troops because they're often less experienced, younger, not all, and it's your job to tame them in a certain way. Awful things happen when they don't, and, and also, you know, it, some commanders do encourage this. I, one of the really dangerous parts of these current wars is uh, the form in which trophies take. Trophies often mean carrying video cameras on your helmet uh, and being out 
past the FOB, the forward operating base, all on your own. This was the case with these urination incidents of the Marine. So you're talking about souvenirs, essentially. They're souvenirs. So in World War II, it might have been a German Luger. Now it's a video. It's a video where you can show your uh, your bravado mm -hmm. in a certain way, and you can take home a souvenir. A good commander will say, no videos. No, no, don't attach them to your helmet because you can get into trouble. And that's what happens, not only trouble with the law, court martials and the like, but trouble in the sense that you, you want to prove yourself on a video. And so you might do things you wouldn't otherwise do, like desecrate the dead by urinating on them. One thing that I, I'm guessing many can uh, uh, relate to is this notion of survivor's guilt. Why me? Why did I get out when my buddy didn't? So survivor's guilt's actually, uh, survivor guilt is actually a relatively new term. Post-Holocaust, about mid-60s, early 60s, about the fact that those who survived are the living dead, and they really didn't feel like they deserved it. So there's a sense that there's a, a finite pie there, and you know, if I got more, someone got less. Um, and that the, the, the check and balance system didn't work out right. That said, it's a very, very real phenomenon in the sense that there's always a way in which you can frame a question that says, could I have done something more? Could I, could I have, you know, I ordered, in the case of war, I ordered us to be on the roof that day. I lost my buddy. It was, I made that call. You know, I was just like a driver who's, who's driving, you know, sh she's driving the vehicle when she hits a kid. She made the call to be out in the vehicle that day. Well, one, all wars uh, have similarities, but then also uh, differences, idiosyncratic differences. And, and one of the things that is a part of this environment is this interrogation, or as it's been called, enhanced interrogation, or as others have said, torture. Right. Uh, the, the movie Zero Dark Thirty has been controversial with some for its treatment of that. Mm -hmm. What are your findings in that regard? What are the soldiers who have dealt with, interrogate, had been interrogators, what are they dealing with? Well, I interviewed in the book, and this is more uh, individual interviews than a social science data collection, mm -hmm. one young man named Will Quinn, who was a student of mine at Georgetown. He was a poster boy post Abu Ghraib, and so did nothing of the, you know, there was no waterboarding that he was involved with. And, you know, he followed, if you like, the best interrogation manuals, which essentially is about building rapport in order to exploit it. That still doesn't sit well, because you're doing something that is not what you would ordinarily do when you build a relationship with someone. And so all of war is about switching, going into doing things in war that you wouldn't do in other places, normalizing the abnormal or the unnormal. And so the switching for what is role specifically OK in war, but not role specifically OK, for example, with your buddies at Georgetown can be very hard, and I think that does leave long trails of, of moral um, of moral guilt. And one, uh, you know, in order to be a good interrogator, you're watching a lot of films. I mean, in the case of Will Quinn, he spent a lot of time watching, you know, decapitations, all, all sorts of things that the enemy was doing that he needed to be able to know in order to interrogate. One of the uh, interesting, uh, other interesting aspects that I hadn't really thought about as clearly is the importance of mission. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write about someone who works here, Derek Vines, uh, a Wilson Center employee, and what he experienced in different missions in different uh, theaters of war. Oh, absolutely. Derek was a wonderful person to talk to because he came home and he used a very, very vivid word. He said suckered. He, he said, mm -hmm. I went to Iraq and I felt suckered. There were, he was because part the mission of it. changed or the, the mission, clarity of the, the mission, mission changed. changed. The mission changed. He was part of a team you know, that was to some degree looking for WMDs, or at least that was, that framed the mission. And he learns that there are no WMDs. And he is constantly subject to death uh, on the battlefield, and he loses his buddies. And, you know, that's got to unwind you and rattle you in a very, very deep way, because it's a sense of betrayal. Yes. One of the, the uh, very untold stories of this war are the horrific injuries that soldiers are, are returning f with. We, we think more in terms of the death count, the casualties, but there are the survivors who uh, also are changed forever, uh, even if they're still alive. You write about a woman, Dawn Halfaker. Who yeah, Dawn is an interesting case. Well, first of all, we just should remember that about nine 
There's nine injuries to one fatality. Nine to one is the right. Three, three to one in Vietnam, roughly. And these aren't necessarily minor injuries. We're talking no, about no. These are significant injuries. Yeah, loss so the, of limbs. Loss of limbs, but also traumatic brain injury, and mm -hmm. those are undocumented largely at this point because people don't really realize that they have some aphasia or cognitive memory failures or the like, brain rattling in in your skull essentially. So Dawn was a star ba uh, basketball player at West Point and was part of a security detail in Iraq training police and everything was quiet until it wasn't quiet and they took a lot of fire one night was ever going around the corner and she essentially lost her arm and um, you know she now does amazingly well in a startup beltway startup company um, but she's always um, you know she tries not to acknowledge her injury but yet it's always there occasionally she'll catch herself looking in a mirror and she feels ghostly or she can't, you know, people don't realize how hard it is to carry a shoulder bag when you, you're you missing the arm on the other side and how, you know, sp how much a burden it puts on your other side and how, how you can text and, and use your Blackberry, your iPhone while armless. And the problem with a lot of these uh, prosthetics is that they're, lo they're either lovely or highly functional. The lovely ones are too heavy, the highly functional ones are still somewhat awkward. And uh, we're now developing technology to, mesh with the neurological system, but there's some ways to go. It's hard to pick the most disturbing aspect of this story, but one of the certainly more disturbing is the suicide rates that are climbing among Yeah, the, the suicide rates are really, um, you know, a reminder to all of us, and it's, the, but it's the, it's the, you know, the tip of the iceberg in a certain way. Those are the individuals for all sorts of ungeneralizable reasons that are falling through the cracks. They still have their arms, you know, that's an issue. They have, still have meds, they're overdosing. They often have come from conflict-ridden families, gone to war that's conflict-ridden, and come home to conflict-ridden families where there's not a lot of ways to resolve the problems. And uh, you know, and it's hard to keep track of all your folks. So I did sit on the suicide review boards for a little while as an observer, the uh, vice chief of the army, and they're heartbreaking stories. Well, all of this leads to a, an obvious question of. Uh, are we doing enough? And it's fairly clear that we aren't. What more do we need to be doing? Well, the families need to be supported. I just happened to notice that Bob Dole and Elizabeth Dole have some sort of fundraising um, activity. Those, and this center also had a program. We all, they also serve. Military families serve. Um, and they, the burden has fallen largely on them. And most of those that serve are unmarried. So it's parents or children that are taking care of others or siblings. Um, we need to really um, dedicate more funds. Um, we need to investigate what moral injury is like and not be afraid both professionally and clin as clinicians and publicly as just neighbors and community members to, to ask um, what's going on. In universities, we need to reach out. It, it, the burden really is on us and not on the returning veteran. And, and I try that very, to do that very hard, but it's easy for them to find comfort and solace amongst each other and not in the larger group. Nancy, have you kept in touch with many of the people who you interviewed and got to know? To some degree. Um, I was here again last year and I certainly have kept in touch with Derek, so that's been quite wonderful. Some have gone off. Um, I meet new individuals also um, as they come into the university and I work closely with the veterans there. Are there some happy endings to talk about? Have people, some people done okay? Yeah, um, absolutely. I talk a lot about Tony Stefano there who really um, had two years at Walter Reed that were pretty miserable. Um, and he has a child going to university now, and he's doing wonderfully. Uh, an older guy who was reserve and guard, and uh, the guitar has always been a kind of source of, of, of fulfillment for him. Yeah, I was amazed. That was one of the happiest stories, that he really, really pulled through, having been deeply suicidal. How, how much of, and I, I'll play psychoanalyst with yeah. you, how, how much of this is uh, for your dad, is unfinished business? Oh, uh, that's fascinating. Um, just to some degree, my, you know, my I, I'm part of a generation that probably many of us, you may be part of that generation too, where we had World War II parents, fathers typically, who did not speak. My dad served in the Navy in World yes, War II. Yes, it's hard to find a family, you know, someone our age that hasn't. And so we never really thought much about it, questioned much about it. But, and, and then many of us were thinking about Vietnam as perhaps an unjust war. And similarly, you know, it's hard, hard not to uh, raise political issues as well as issues of conscience about the cause for which these two wars 
in this in this decade have been fought. So some of it is um, let's not go back. Let's not go back to the road where our fathers were, where they bring home issues. There's occasional rage. I had an uncle too that was in Okinawa. I'm sure he suffered. He did suffer from post-traumatic stress, and only when it got diagnosed as a disorder post-Vietnam did he realize that's what he had. Um, and you know, there's drugs, there's homelessness, there's a lot of public issues. That This is a, as, as um, Steve Zanakis, a, a retired um, general who's a psychiatrist in the military, this is a public health issue that we need to consider as such. And it, given there's family and it expands outward, it's, um, it, it's epidemic size. Well, and we need to take that seriously. Thank you sincerely for telling the story and for sharing your stories with us today. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. it. Thank you. We'll be back after the break to talk about Venezuela after Chavez. Stay with us, please. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Eric Olson is Associate Director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program. He joins us to discuss the death of Hugo Chavez. Eric, welcome back to Dialogue. Thanks, glad to be here. Uh, in a BBC story before Hugo Chavez passed, the question raised was continuity or crisis. So I'll start with that question uh, post-Chavez. Uh, are we looking at continuity for the Venezuelan government or is this a, a crisis of some sort? Well, in the short run, probably continuity. I think it's more of a long-term question, an immediate question. There's phenomenal outpouring of sympathy and respect and growing myth around Hugo Chavez. And so it's pretty hard for the opposition to sort of overcome that in the short run. Uh, there were two important elections last year, the presidential election in October and then state elections in December. and. Chavez and his allies won both of those handedly. So there is still a lot of strong popular support for Hugo Chavez, and it's likely they'll continue. The question is, will they continue long term, or with the absence of that charismatic leader, will their hold and grip on power began, begin to wane? How much do we know about uh, transition? from Mr. Chavez to a, a new leader. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of time to plan for this. There is, and there is some clarity in the Venezuelan constitution, which is a, a good thing. Uh, the constitution says that if the president dies before he's able to take office, or if he dies before the first, in the first four years, uh, then there is an interim president named and then a new election called within 30 days. So that's the plan now to, you know, uh, the, the vice president, the sitting vice president uh, was Chavez's choice to be his successor. He is the interim president now and they will hold a, a, an election uh, in 30 days, early uh, April. And you don't think that's enough time for the opposition to raise a credible no, challenge? No, that's, that's the problem from the perspective of the opposition. Mm -hmm. Having lost election in October and December and only having 30 days in this period of mourning and great empathy for Chavez, it's unlikely that the opposition is going to have the strength to overcome it in the short run. In the long run, again, there's the possibility. Maybe Maduro is not as able, he's certainly not as charismatic as Chavez to hold on to the Chavismo uh, spirit. Uh, so that's where the open questions are, six months, a year, two years from now. The charisma question, this is big shoes to fill. This was a large presence. How, what, what changes, and we'll look at it in-country, regionally, and even globally, the, the space that Chavez filled, which was, is going to be difficult to fill by, for anyone? A, a huge, uh, uh, again, the outpouring of sympathy, the fact that he's equated with Venezuela's national liberator, Simon Bolivar. They place Simon Bolivar's uh, sword on his casket. I mean, really created a myth, a myth around. Yes, a, a tremendous. Uh, so, you know, that's very difficult, and it would be hard even for his protégés, in this case Nicolas Maduro, to fill those shoes. He's not a charismatic leader, Maduro, uh, the way Chavez is, so it'll be difficult. Now, we don't know, maybe he can handle the economy and all those things uh, better, 
that's an open question, but it will be hard for him to fill those shoes. Chavez did play an enormous role internationally as well through his access to Venezuelan uh, petroleum riches, oil riches. He, he gave subsidized uh, oil, petroleum to poor uh, uh, Caribbean nations uh, that don't have their own sources of energy, Central American nations, most notably Cuba, but really all over Central America. He even donated famously uh, uh, oil or petroleum through Citgo to uh, Joe Kennedy mm -hmm. and his uh, energy company for a subsidized rates. So he's had an enormous uh, impact and in South America he's promoted new forms of multilateral interaction that kind of bypass the organization of American state and really promote initially a solidarity within South America, something we hadn't seen in the past. It seems very difficult to sort out in trying to figure out what happens next. Uh, those tangible things like oil assets and those intangibles, this charismatic figure. It, it definitely is. And one of the things that Venezuela faces, quite frankly, is they have, on the one hand, the world's largest proven source of, of oil, petroleum, uh, and yet, on the other hand, every year of the last several years, declining production. Mm -hmm. In other words, lack of investment in that resource. And the, what's kept them uh, afloat, if you will, is the relatively high prices. So they've been able to s offset declining production by higher prices. That's not a given going forward. And unless they deal with that problem, they'll face some serious challenges. In, in, intriguing figure in that he was almost demonized and idolized in equal measure. Uh, what is the, the Chavez legacy? Well, you know, uh, you're right. I mean, Venezuela today is a very polarized country. On the one hand, you have very passionate uh, people following and loving him because not just because he promised things for the poor, but I think the poor identified with him. He wasn't from the elite classes that have ruled Venezuela for the last decades. He was a common man, uh, poor, uh, grew up by the bootstraps, if you will, quite literally being a military officer. So he created this uh, image that's very polarizing in, in Venezuela. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a real challenge for Venezuela to overcome that going forward. Well, Eric, thank you for uh, shedding some light for us today. I look forward to speaking to you about it again as things move forward. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks to Eric, and also thanks to Nancy Sherman, who joined us earlier in the program. That's all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molusky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetwork.org.